I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susi. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello and welcome to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And today we are here with Aubrey. Uh, she might seem familiar to some of y'all um, with us doing the interviews at the Sorrel Weed House for our series that is coming out soon. So... Um, Aubrey is a tour guide here in Savannah, if you're not familiar with that yet. So uh, we are going to be talking about other Savannah ghosts, So, And Aubrey's got some different experiences, too, outside of the Sorrel Weed House. So you'll definitely get more of your Sorrel Weed House fix from those other episodes. But uh, Aubrey, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, not much to say. My name's Aubrey. I've been in the Savannah area for roughly five years now. And... If we're going to get into the paranormal stuff, my paranormal lifestyle started all the way back when I was two, long before I moved here back in Maryland, and honestly, didn't expect to be a tour guide, didn't expect to be a ghost guide specifically, just so I'm to end up working in haunted locations and somehow found my way there. So. Sure. Absolutely. Now, um, you said that you lived in a haunted house. Do you want to kind of like tell some of your favorite stories from that? Yeah, so I grew up in the house. I was there when I, from the age of two to about 10, and I kind of assumed it was haunted. I'm more of a sensitive, so I'm definitely open to a lot of the spiritual stuff, and I noticed that there was always a kid that would steal my toys, which is expected. You know, I'm young, and there's a kid. Of course, he's going to steal my toys. That's what kids do, and I would always be upset about it and would always complain to my mom about it, but, you know, she's like, well, you just misplaced it. You're just a kid. You probably lost it. It's probably underneath the bed. It's fine. So she never kind of bought into any of it. And then, like most kids, I'd go and run with my friends behind the houses in the woods, not thinking about snakes or ticks or anything bad like that. And I had vaguely remembered coming across a cemetery. And it's like, oh, cemetery. Back to playing. Just kind of disregarded it. But my grandmother still owns the house to this day. And so then I was eventually kind of curious who this kid was. So I went back to visit her, found the cemetery again, and discovered that there was, in fact, one grave for one kid. And what's really interesting is the kid that I kept seeing was looked like he was four or five years old, dressed in, like, black shorts with a white button-up shirt and black vest. So I'd put him at roughly the 1800s I'd put him at. And so found one grave for one kid, died when he was four years, 11 months in the late 1880s. Then I was like, well, found out his name is Frank, named him Frank, and he's responded well to it. And since my grandmother still has the house, I still have some of my childhood toys down in the base room for him to play with. Aww. Whatever makes him happy, I'll still visit and say hi. So he's kind of like a long-term dead pen pal at this point, I guess, <laughs> is the best way to put it. That's awesome. Um, yeah, no, it's always so interesting to hear people's experiences with their house spirits, especially if they're sensitive to spirits. Um, and it's really sweet that you leave toys for them because mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a haunted house as well. Uh, in Florida, though, which has a whole different uh, realm of spirits, my spirits in my house were a Native American family that lived on the property because my uh, family built the house on this big open piece of land. Um, and we realized that it was a area where uh, a tribe had been because we looked into the history of the land, found that out. Um, my interactions were not like that. My, my, uh, my spirits did not take my toys at all, but they would, you know, um, wake me up by like grabbing my shoulders and shaking me. And like, you know, usually when they were in a panic of some sort, uh, for whatever reason they might be, but did you ever have like kind of any experiences like that where they interacted with you outside of just like taking toys and things like that? Uh, not really. There were actually quite a few spirits on the property that were spread out through the neighborhood. I found out after doing some research that apparently the neighborhood was initially back in the mid-1800s uh, apple orchard plantation. Oh. And so there were some other spirits. Uh, some of them weren't as friendly. 
there was one that I kind of dubbed him as the slave master because I'm pretty sure that's what he did. And he's, as I'm sure you can imagine, not the nicest guy. And so usually uh, Frank and I would just kind of hide out in my room and kind of did the, like the buddy system anywhere we went. So he'd usually he'd like share the bed with me. And if slave master was around, we'd try to avoid that room at all cost. So wow. that was the extent of it. Uh, slave masters never actually like physically harm me or anything, but you would just get that really uneasy of he doesn't like me. I don't like him. I don't want to be near this area. I want to get out. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's a very fair assessment. And um, I think people tend to forget that sometimes intelligent hauntings, you know, uh, can be uh, a, an unkind spirit because they were unkind in their life, but not be demonic or, you mm. know, malevolent. They're just a bad person uh, because we, we do tend to also uh, separate the two where like we, we like to almost forget that this was a human being at some point and not all humans were good people. So, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there are plenty of people you encounter in daily living where you're like, that guy creeps me out or <laughs> yeah. that person has a bad you know energy about them. So yeah, it would absolutely transfer into death, especially somebody who lived by fear. You know, if you were in that position, your whole existence was about being cruel and instilling fear so that you would have authority. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, now, is there um, like a certain ghost experience that you have that like was like one that really stood out to you or like what was like your first ghost experience? Oh, gosh. I don't really remember my first. Again, when I as soon as I moved into the house, I two years old and right off the bat when I met Frank I started having stuff happen by way of playing with him um the only I think main thing that really stood out for my childhood was I had gone on a family trip to Italy and we were staying in an 800 year old villa surprise surprise of course it's haunted uh and of course I'm there with my family so they don't listen to anything I have to say about that stuff because it's just all in my head it's just an imaginary friend but there were two little girls and even worse I was 10 years old at the time I don't speak Italian and they kept talking to me while I was trying to sleep and they'd laugh and they'd rummage through all of the stuff in my suitcase and they were messing with my items and I don't know what they're saying and they're laughing at me and this happened every single night so every single night I had kept trying to go into my mom's room and be like no I'd rather stay in here you know I can't sleep with the girls they keep messing with my stuff and it was just constant good news is she was traveling with her friend as well. And her, apparently her friend snored heavily. So they're like, let's do a switch off. Yeah. You know, friend that snores all the time can have this room. And then I'll just hide in the bedroom of, with my mom and hope that the girls can kind of just, they can have my stuff. They can play with it. They can yeah. laugh. They can just leave me alone so I can sleep. Absolutely. So that one really stuck out a lot too. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an interesting experience because I, I don't think I've ever encountered a spirit where I didn't necessarily speak the same language as them. So it, that's a fun um, encounter because it's like, how do you navigate that when there's that, that barrier between you? There's already a barrier because you're alive and they're not, you know, but that's uh, where you can't even say like, stop, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like do not touch the things. It seems like a lot of kid ghosts are kind of like attracted to you. Which is really funny because I really am not a fan of living children. I find them <laughs> ugly. And I mentioned that a lot on my tours. Like, I love the kid ghosts, but only the kid ghosts. You bring a living kid on my tour, and then we've got issues because I just don't know how to handle them properly. It was never my thing. I never had that maternal instinct. So I'm just like, dead kids? Great. Living kids? Uh, I don't know what to do. I guess because dead kids have their own way of being. They kind of, like, they don't really... They don't have rules necessarily, so they just kind of they just kind of do what they want, um, which you know takes the pressure off of you know you're already dead. Well, you know it's you kind of do whatever you want at this mm -hmm. point. Um, so you said you worked in the Kehoe House. Um, have you ever had any experience with kid ghosts in the Kehoe House? Oh boy, I've had an experience with all the spirits there. I'm yeah. We're on a first name basis after the time that I spent there. Uh, I worked there for about three years ago and. I'm sorry, I worked there about a year ago for three years, and I, from the first day that I was being interviewed, I ran into Miss Kehoe, uh, she was just kind of sitting in one of the rooms, I was like, oh, if there's a lady sitting in the chair, cool, and then I kind of just like, continue with my tour, continue to see what's going on here, eventually start working there, 
And then I discovered there's also Mr. Kehoe there, their daughter, Annie, which is interesting because this kind of touches base with what we were talking about at the Sorrel Weed House, how you could sometimes change your age when you're mm-hmm. dead. Well, Annie only was about eight years old, uh, eight days old when she died, but she shows up as an eight-year-old girl. Oh. So we, she responds to Annie, and so it makes sense that she could be Annie, maybe manipulating her age, but at the same time, it could just be a completely different Annie. We're not 100% sure, but either way, she's there, and she is such a sweet little bundle of fun. Uh, she likes to play hide-and-seek a lot, and she'll play peekaboo with the covers, and she'll just run up and down the stairs, say hi, mess with you, especially if you're a girl with long hair. She'll braid your hair sometimes, and you can kind of feel that. And then generally, young boys are going to be kind of rambunctious in a handful. That's usually how it works. And they do have another kid there who I don't think is a tie to the Kehoe's, but is a tie to the property. Uh, and he would usually be the prankster. Uh, he's the one that would lock me out of the rooms if I had to go do something just to be kind of rude and a jerk. I could go through all five master keys, go through every individual room key, can't get the door open. Have my coworker go up to open the door. Oh, Aubrey, it's already unlocked. What are you talking about? Of course it is. Uh, he gave me a slight joke shove when I was trying to get out a window balcony, which initially I get that instinct of, oh my God, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall off a balcony. I'm going to die. But also it's like, no, it's just him. He's not actually trying to harm me. He just wants to give me that little jump scare spook that he has a tendency to do. So definitely a lot there by way of kids, adults, everyone. Wow. Yeah. Cause, um, it's funny because the Kehoe House, for those of you listening who are not super familiar with the Kehoe House, it's an adult-only, like, hotel. So it's so ironic that there are so many kid ghosts. But there's also, like, a lot of misinformation with the stories mm-hmm. of the Kehoe um, House because of the twins um, dying in the fireplace. Fireplace. What a horrible a Legend. horrible eggs, right? <laughs> so um, basically, the story, how the story goes was that the twin boys, you know, they liked playing hide and seek, which I mean, is common for kids, obviously. Uh, but they would often hide in the fireplace. And one night, Miss Kehoe um, set a fire in the um, fireplace at the main floor or whatever it was. And because, you know, the fireplaces are all in one chimney, the kids ended up burning alive because of the fire down below them. And so their dad essentially unknowingly murdered their his kids. But the common theme throughout Savannah is yeah. the unwitting parent killing child stories. Yeah, even though it's not true. It's not. It's, so, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a true story, and there's no documentation of it. But I wonder how, like, <laughs> Mr. Kehoe as a spirit would feel about, you know, hearing that it's like, oh, everybody talks about how you killed your kids, you know? <laughs> it's Well, like, we talk about this a lot on the podcast is uh, when you have ghost stories and people tell a ghost story over and over and over again, and that ghost story was the children in the in the building, it makes the building, marks the building as child-friendly for ghosts. You know, it, yeah. it, this could be a haven for a ghost to show up. And all you really got to do is run around, jiggle the, the doorknobs yeah. a little, respond. Uh, and that's one of those things where sometimes the, the function of being a ghost does fall upon spirits. And there are a lot of homeless spirits out there, a lot of spirits that don't have the house to haunt, that don't have you know the wrong to set right. They are just simply in between existences. And they're looking for a place that they can get uh, attention, where, where people will, will give them some form of interaction. And you go to a big haunted house and, and people are looking for children ghosts and people are oh, talking yeah. about children ghosts and they tell the story standing in front of the house. It's so inviting for a spirit to want to be in a place that accepts their existence, that cherishes their existence, that will actually literally say, this place is haunted and not board up the windows yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and run screaming from the building. So, you know, I think that uh, in, in a lot of cases, ghosts will gravitate to places where ghost stories are told mm-hmm. simply because that means there's acceptance and that people are, are already in the habit of believing. They're already willing to give a little of themselves for the mystique and the mystery. So, yeah. Well, 
Um, out of the, the ghosts that uh, you, you talked about in the Kehoe house, the one that really uh, piques my curiosity is uh, the Annie. A- Annie, who was uh, eight days old when she died and now mm-hmm. looks like she's eight years old. That's a big jump. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th- it's very rare it, to see a spirit manipulate their age in that way. Um, to an age that they never were. Yeah. You know, a lot of times an older spirit will show up as their child self, but a younger spirit showing up as an older version of themselves is very intriguing. It's like, yeah. it, 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 it opens a lot of doors for conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's, um, what's kind of like your take on why you think, because uh, I don't know if you know more history about Annie than we would, because I'm not super familiar with Annie. Um, do you have like kind of any ideas of why you think she's showing up as an eight year old versus an eight day old? Um, it's not undocumented that we've had these reports before in the paranormal field where they would have someone like, and I know mediums have especially kind of touched base on this, where you'd have an uh, infant that died at a young age due to just malnourished, not thriving, anything like that. And then a medium would be able to have a conversation and, and explain to the parents, yes, they're here and you know this is what's going on. So it wouldn't surprise me. But also, you can't really do much at eight days old. So this would give her a chance to still enjoy that piece of being a childhood, which she didn't get to do while she was alive. Mm-hmm. And plus, I know Miss Kehoe was quite fond of, well, not just her, but all of her children. She was a very nurturing mother, very, very well-groomed, perfect mother. Like, she is the ideal picture of the woman that's going to care, love, cherish everyone that comes into the home. So I think, especially for Annie, you already have that attachment that Miss Kehoe has to her, being the daughter, and also the only child that she lost at a young age. And then Annie, knowing that and accepting that and having that capability to potentially come back and getting to live a, or live, uh, a fairly good afterlife. Yeah. Yeah, and it even suggests that concept of nurturing a spirit Miss Kehoe using her her sorrow, her grief to think about the growth mm-hmm. of Annie and think about what she would be like at one and w- mm-hmm. what she'd be like at two, giving form to a spirit that is now vicariously existing in our world. It also touches upon the concept of long souls, souls that, uh, you know, the concept of reincarnation, of in, in your in-between life, you're planning to come to this world. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a lot of books. Um, the one that comes to mind is uh, Many Masters, Many Servants, mm-hmm. which is about the idea that we are, we live multiple lifetimes and in the in-between of life, we kind of map out what we're going to do in the next life, who, who our parents are going to be, where we're going to come, and we come to this world full of it. And, and you hear this a lot about children from one to three talking about past lives, talking about in-between experiences, having these amazing uh, conversations when they're very, very young about this, this concept of, of having a wisdom and having a, 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 an identity and a thought process, which is, is interesting because if, if you die at eight, eight days old, you might still have one foot in the in-between world mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, with, a, with a firm grasp of, of a lot of intelligence and a lot of, of, of life knowledge. And you could remain growing as, as that entity because you had a trajectory planned. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, it's, it's an interesting theory, a, an interesting thought. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the concept of reincarnation, past lives and past life regression, and even future life regression, which I've heard people have, have actually sat down and had um, progression, future life progression, mm-hmm. like hypnotic uh, episodes where they would talk about life, you know, <laughs> their mm-hmm. next life. Because uh, a lot of people talk about how people have past lives, but apparently uh, there is one doctor who was able to progress people into recognizing their future lives. Interesting. No. Um, your kid actually. Yes, that is correct. Um, That's how I got this involved. <laughs> yes. Um, a sushi had, uh, like, you know, re- memories as a kid, right? Mm-hmm. Where they, uh, could. Two remember- very distinct memories. One as a, a murder victim. That's it. Yes. And one as a old farmer. Old farmer. <laughs> well, and a distinct conversation, uh, they had with me when they were like three years old was when we were in heaven together. Oh. 
um, they said that we decided that because I was Sushi's son in the last life, mm-hmm. that they would be my child in the next life. And that was the conversation that we had. <laughs> and apparently I came down and, and it ended with, with them saying, you made me wait a long time <laughs> uh, because I was 32 when, uh, when they were born. And it was, it was definitely like odd because the whole conversation was weird. It started with, uh, they're three years old and they look at me and say, remember when I lost my teeth? And it was like, oh you haven't even gotten all your teeth. A, B, we've never talked about teeth falling out. Mm-hmm. So out of the blue, we're eating breakfast and they're like, remember when my teeth fell out? And I was like, your teeth never fell out. You know, no, like, my teeth, fell, I was really sad because my teeth had fallen out. And I was like, no, you know, lived on the farm. And I'm like, what are you saying? And they went on to talk about being an old man uh, and how they died. The, uh, the truck was broken down. So they had to ride the tractor into town and they got stuck on a train track and got hit by a train. And that whole story unfolded three years old and none of that made sense. Not knowing that trucks break down even like knowing that language is like, where are you getting this? Mm -hmm. What are they, what are they teaching you at daycare? (laughs) (laughs) And, and so it was just such a peculiar thing. But I, uh, at that point, that's actually when I picked up many master's Mm -hmm. when I, when I started really looking into this concept because, um, they kind of suggested that we were at a train station and I rode a train back to earth and then they rode a train to their mother's belly. Uh-huh. And it was, it was like we were, we were at the train station going, so what about this life? And, mm-hmm. and they were like, well, I'll be your kid. And I'm like, oh, okay. And yeah. I got on the train. And, and then I, I apparently wasted 32 years. <laughs> Without them. <laughs> Without them. And they came back and they're like, geez. And the other past life was like, what, they were a victim of Albert Fish? That is correct. Yeah. It was very disturbing. Uh, and JT's I felt- face just dropped. He was, I felt so guilty because, so, so here's this story. Yep. <laughs> um, again, this is around the same time, three, three years old-ish. Um, we we're playing in, the, in, in uh, their bedroom and they say they took Albert to jail in an ambulance. And out of the blue, they took Albert to jail in an ambulance. And I don't know what they're saying. I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 what? <laughs> Who is Albert? And why is he going to jail? And why in an ambulance? <laughs> and, uh, and they said, oh, he's a bad man. He's such a bad man. And I was like, who is Albert? <laughs> and uh, they go on to say, so the, the next phrases were, he hurt me real bad. He took a whole week to eat me. Ooh. <laughs> and when they said that, like all the hair on the back of my neck stood up because I remembered distinctly Albert Fish wrote a letter to his first victim's family. And in the letter, he states, I took a week to eat her. And uh, her name was Gracie Budd. And... um. And Gracie Bud, the picture of Gracie Bud that they had looked exactly like sushi. It was eerie and strange and terrifying. And then <laughs> sushi says, I stayed because I didn't want any of the other kids to be alone. Stating that they were a ghost at the shack mm-hmm. where Albert Fish killed multiple children. And it's just like, all of it was terrible. <laughs> And I, 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 I like put a cork on the conversation. Yeah. I was like, we're not going to talk about this. This is going to be the last time we talk about it. And I let years and years go by. Uh, I think when they were seven years old, I, I kind of like, do you remember when you said you were a farmer? And they were like, what? <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm uh, just checking. Just, <laughs> yeah. just seeing if you remember having this conversation. I'm like, no. I'm like, okay. But yeah, that was... Uh, a terribly disturbing series of events. And my fear was that they inherited it because I was mm. a little bit of a uh, serial killer junkie and I had read, you know, all the books and the stories and, and I was invested in those stories and I worried that somehow it genetically sure. passed and the, you know, the R, R DNA, <laughs> the yeah. RNA um, passage of, of knowledge and they were privy to it. Uh, but yeah, it was it was compelling and frightening. 
that just like gave me chills when you said it took me a week to eat her. Oh, I I'm like it shocked me it, 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 to the core. Not to mention one time I was I was playing with a puppet around the same time, and um and I I, I bonked the puppet on the head to to make it pass out, and <laughs> sushi again. I, I think this was even like two and a half years old. Um, where where she had a kitchen playset and grabbed a kitchen knife, went behind the puppet and pulled the knife across the throat of the puppet and said, that's how you kill it. Oh. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we're not going to play this anymore. Because <laughs> I was like, I didn't kill the puppet. They were very sure that, 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 that killing was a big part of everything. Uh, I had to argue for a long time that Pokemon are not being killed when their eyes go squiggly. <laughs> I was like, no, I think they're just being knocked out. No, they're dying. <laughs> That's how you catch a Pokemon. You kill it. And I'm like, okay, um, creepy child. <laughs> we are not going to kill cute little animals, right? We're not. That's not what we want to do. We, we don't feel like killing cute little animals, right? But yeah, it was, uh, that was a, a, a bizarrely harrowing time. Yeah. Aubrey's like, what did I agree to come on to? <laughs> I'm just thinking, oh my God, I can't watch Pokemon again. <laughs> They're not dead. <laughs> Are you sure? Because now I have to question everything about my life decisions well, it going is, up. It is a problem because the argument was pretty sound. Uh, the, the argument went on, well, they turn into spirits so they can fit into the ball. At which point I was like, I don't actually have an explanation why they fit into the ball. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, it's because they're dead and they turn into ghosts and the ghosts go into the ball. I'm like, um... <laughs> Yes, but <laughs> no, no, no. The balls are special. They're they're magic. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, uh, you know, interest in like things of that morbidity, I think, is just human nature for I think sure. So. Um, I mean, like humans throughout history have always been interested in morbid things, like you know how in England in the Victorian era, because Victorians were so morbid, y'all. Morbid. Like, I love it. I love it too. <laughs> it's great. And um, but like in Europe, they would oftentimes take Jane Doe's or John Doe's and put the bodies in the window of mm -hmm. the morgue um, to try to get people to identify it. But really all it did was people would come up and they'd be like, ooh, I want to see the dead body, which is, you know, in theory, like what? Uh, well, just the common practice of the photography with dead bodies. Oh, yeah. You know, if a family member died, you would actually prop them up with the family mm -hmm. and they would be sitting on the lap or sitting in, in, in the picture. And that, that, that did not seem odd at all because they were celebrating and they were you know memorializing but when you look back at it you're like oh all those people are just kind of hanging off of that dead person and it's kind of creeping me out now i mean i can't say anything because i've got tightly it doesn't seem as creepy if you i've got to think about it but i've got the ashes of various pets in here so i've got it's just, I got dead bodies chilling on my neck, technically, <laughs> yeah. if you really want to think about it's it. true. So. Well, and that's just it. We, uh, the way we memorialize the dead has gone through so many changes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I love the idea of turning um, the ash of a loved one into a diamond. Oh, yeah. You it's, know, that, that compression great. into a diamond. I'm like, that's amazing. That's beautiful, you know. Well, and the, especially now, I feel like we're almost taking back some of the stuff from the Victorians where we are creating something out of our loved ones or our familiars, you know, um, where there's people who actually will take blood from past mm. loved ones and make rings out of it. And so that you can have something that was literally pumping through your loved one's body and it feels very attached um, and, you know, how people still take sometimes nowadays take hair from their loved ones sure. and put it in lockets, just like the Victorians did, or wearing ashes, you know, it's, it's a thing. Um, and, you know, it, human remains in a lot of ways, I mean, if you look at it from a witchcraft perspective, it binds you to them in a certain way. And so if it's your loved one, of course you would want to feel bound to well, them. And the fact that there is a natural uh, force that handles the dead and we've totally disregarded it we yeah. pump the body full of chemicals we 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 preserve it we cover it in wax and we you know reconstruct mm -hmm. it and then we put it in a box that is hermetically sealed and it's like i think we're supposed to feed the grass or you know i think, right. I think we're supposed to re-enter the the system and and those practices are all about our fear of death our fear of decay our fear of 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 mm -hmm. losing life which I think is coming 
back with a backlash with all the paranormal experiences that people are having is how long can you pretend death isn't a thing before death really makes you aware of itself, you know, yeah. before it, it, before all these bodies who have, you know, been filled with formaldehyde are saying, Hey, you know, I should have been gone by now. My body should have dissolved and, and, and reentered and I should have, you know, uh, but instead I, if you dug me up, I'd look pretty good yeah. because I am like a Twinkie now, oh. <laughs> you know, just a Twinkie in the coffin. <laughs> Um, hashtag hashtag twink twink twink. Oh, God. oh God, our fans are going to have a field day with that one. <laughs> but it's true though. Uh, put it on the march list. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, um, I like the idea though. I, I heard this from a tour guide when I was in Edinburgh. Um, why, you know, when a headstone falls and the earth sorts, uh, sort of consumes the headstone, it's almost like you're finally returning back right. to the earth. And I think that's a very beautiful way of thinking about it. Never thought about, you know, um, people being pumped with um, preservative. pres preservatives. Yeah. Um, and how they would look nowadays. Because I do think about, you know, how... Uh, olden decomposition would work where right. before we had those types of chemicals, but it is fascinating. Also, if it makes you feel better, I just remembered this. Uh, when my mom went into labor with me, uh, she had to spend a certain amount of time, uh, you know, counting the contractions and stuff. And so she watched the entire series about Ted Bundy while oh, in labor oh, for no. me. Oh, it explains so much. Oh, it does. It makes a lot of sense. So don't feel like a bad parent for, you know. For, for reading up on yeah. serial killers so much. Absolutely. She was like, well, that was what was interesting on um, on TV. And so, you know, we watched Ted Bundy. And I was like, sounds about right. It's on brand. You Do you know? have a favorite ghost story not set in a place like a favorite ghost story just in general in general oh god a favorite ghost story in general mm, not really interesting no honestly i think the paranormal has just always been so normal in my life <laughs> that i don't think too much of it Nothing like stands out right because when i talk to like my guests at the tours and they're like well you know explain something like something that happened to you and i'll explain something they're like oh, i'd be running and i'm just sitting there I was like it was a tuesday <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is normal uh so honestly no i and i don't even really focus too much on the events that occur i'm more focused on the spirits as people and it's like well let me tell you about this guy that i met that was walking down the street three weeks ago and how he died and why he's just sitting on the side of the road. For Is he wearing a purple shirt? No, he wasn't wearing a purple shirt. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> we, we, were, we have a mystery. <laughs> we, we do have a mystery about uh, a spirit I saw a couple days ago. And um, what is that? Troop Square? Mm. Um, yeah. Just a random dude. And <laughs> an African-American guy in a purple shirt. Just random. But, okay. you know, it is what it is. Uh, we're, <laughs> but we're trying to figure out, oh, we're like, who could he have been? But, you know, it's... Um, but I, I totally get where you're coming from with, you know, it feels normal. Because mm. uh, people have always questioned me with why I don't freak out when I see ghosts. And I'm just like, well, it's just, it's just a ghost, you know. It's, yeah. just, it's just a person. Yeah. It's like seeing anyone else on the street. Absolutely. And that was how um, when we... When JT and I were on FaceTime and he saw the little boy in the Davenport house and he was panicking and he's like, oh my God, my wife is in the house by herself with this ghost and I don't understand it. And I was like, it's all good. It's all good. I'm going to go back downstairs. I'm going to eat my Cheetos and I'm going to just like chill. Uh, it's, you know, it seems like when you um, have enough experiences, it's just, it's a part of life, you know, it's a part of it. Like you, I feel like people who are sensitive, including how I feel, you know, it's, uh, it, it just is what it is, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're just there, they're just chilling, they're just vibing, sometimes they're not, they're sometimes, you know, very crazy, rambunctious, but, um, now, do you have, like, a, like, what was your first experience, um, with a spirit in Savannah? I always like to hear people's first Savannah ghost experience. Goodness gracious, let's see. Hmm. Well, as soon as you get to the bridge, you've got the people that have jumped off for a suicide. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I haven't had a chance to, like, actually stop to talk to any of them. Plus, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. It's kind of a hit or miss. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which just sounds kind of funny in a very <laughs> bad way. <laughs> um, and then when I actually, like, got into town, technically I was here mainly for visiting purposes because I 
worked, I live in South Carolina and I work out uh, on Hilton Head at the time. And first time at Grayface, there's that little boy with blonde hair. And then I meant to bring him a car and I never did. But I always say hi if that counts for anything. Oh, Whenever yeah. I stop by. There's a creepy, I think it's like now an apartment complex building out by City Market. Won't even step onto that property. Will not step on that sidewalk. I'll cross the street to avoid that because there's something bad in there and I don't know what it is. But it will stare at you through the windows, which mm-hmm. really creeps me out. Uh, so that's a big no and I'll avoid that. Um, there's the lady in blue that's out on Madison Square and she just attended the church that's there all the time. And then her, that's where she got married to her husband. So she was familiar with the church for that. And then her husband died and that's where they had the service. And then she died. That's where they had service. So she always stops by the church, like on a daily basis, like a constant routine for her. Um, and then there's the people at Davenport House that I frequently see sitting in the courtyard. When I used to work at Kehoe, I'd have to mm-hmm. walk by. I could go on oh, and on. Yeah. River Street, the alleyways, uh, every single block, every single street, there's going to be someone. So the list kind of just from day one, I was like, all right, it's. To, I knew it was going to be a haunted city. I've just, I guess I wasn't super prepared of, despite how small the downtown area is, how haunted it really it is it is and then when I started learning about the history I was like well yeah no wonder it's haunted I'm walking on 20,000 dead bodies that were shoved in a tunnel yes you know of course this is gonna happen so yeah uh, the way I describe it to people is we're the lasagna of the damned we're (laughs) just layers and layers layers of them you know um it's true it's uh Savannah is such a place where it, you just got a spirit for everything. Mm-hmm. And people still die every day. People still, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but worth noting that there are places with worst histories, but not as much activity. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of that has to do with the living's attitude Absolutely. towards the paranormal. The fact that, that for the most part, Savannah as a whole is very open to the concept of ghosts and open to that, which allows for spirits to not be pressured to hide or not to, to relegate themselves to shadows, mm-hmm. you know, um, cause in a lot of cultures when you're dead, you're shunned, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we have so many variants of how to keep a spirit away. Mm-hmm. And they, they come down to fascinating. We were talking about, um, tombstones just a second ago, you know, the belief that, uh, to carve a name into stone is to bind the spirit to the stone. So that's where they belong. You can go home. <laughs> it's like they're stuck to the stone. And uh, when a stone falls over, that's a common belief. If a a stone falls over, it means the spirit has released itself Mm -hmm. from its, you know, its bond to the stone. Um, But one of the most intriguing ones was a spirit will last as long as their name is legible on the stone. And they're trying to give you as much time (laughs) to settle affairs and, and not bug anybody before, you know, the, the legibility on the stone is gone and the spirit is no longer tethered. Absolutely. The, um, yeah, I mean, we definitely are a town that really loves our ghosts. Embraces I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, even in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, there's like a quote from it. I don't know the exact quote, but it goes along the lines of to understand Savannians, you have to understand our ghosts. Because um, we feel a very, very deep attachment to them. And I'm not even a native Savannian, but I feel very attached to these spirits, you know. I, I think they all just still, they, it's almost like they love Savannah so much that they couldn't oh, leave, yeah. you know? How could you leave? I mean, the living, they, they'll show up and be like, I'm going to live here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, it's the dark charm of the city that makes even the dead want to stick around a little bit longer. Like, especially, I'm like, I, I would want to live in the Davenport house if I was a ghost. <laughs> I, I may do it. You never know. Because um, I love those ghosts. They're, they're wonderful. The kid ghosts in there are so fun. It's like uh, me with the key hose, and I yeah. gave them the heads up when I was working there. It's like, well, if I die and you want to know if I'm haunting there, check the electrical kettle. I'm a big tea drinker, so <laughs> yeah. it's always going to be hot and ready to go for <laughs> when anyone, I don't care if it's 3 a.m. What if a guest wants a cup of tea? I got to make sure the kettle's hot. That's Absolutely. just going to be my big thing. And I, like I said, I do love the key hose. They've mm-hmm. helped me out a lot. And people sometimes, I guess, don't realize that, yes, spirits are interesting. The paranormal is so fascinating. And it's definitely really cool to investigate, check out all that fun stuff. But also, it is possible for people to form bonds like that between the living and dead, not just to family members. Like, they are my extended family, and I was there long enough to get to know them that 
I know their habits. I know what they like. I know what they don't like. And they were the same way with me. They knew my habits, my likes, my dislikes. Miss Kehoe would join me at what, like 1.30 every morning as soon as I got my paperwork done, we'd have a nice morning cup of tea. And I knew that she would actually join me for tea because even though I wouldn't set a teacup out, I'd occasionally hear what sounded like a porcelain saucer land on the glass coffee table. So I could hear that being put down. It's like, okay, she's here enjoying the teacup with me. That's so cute. I love that. I love that idea. Jim, Jim, if you're listening, my house ghost, Jim, if you're <laughs> listening, we're going to have coffee in the mornings. I want my ghost to <laughs> have coffee with me. Um, yeah, it, it is true. You, you can form bonds with people, um, as a spirit because they're, they're still a soul, mm -hmm. you know, they still can have an attachment to you. Um, I know that it, you have said that you have your own uh, spirits that kind of follow you around. Cause we, we talk about, you know, people are more likely to be haunted than houses. Mm -hmm. So do you have, uh, you want to talk about any of your spirits that kind of stick with you? Um, I've got one, and I like her because she's so different. Uh, so, and this kind of falls into, again, the random five million paranormal theories that everyone has. Uh, some people do believe that people, and especially this usually pertains to spirit guides, can transform into different sure. everything. So I've got this one little girl. And of course, it's always a kid. Why is it always a kid? They love um, you. <laughs> uh, but I don't like children. So I've got a little girl that's... I don't know, probably like seven years old. And she's in this cute little white lace, like almost like a Lolita little dress. And she's got her white gloves with the lace trim. And she's got hair that's like all blonde and curly and it's always kind of pinned back. She's an adorable, sweet little thing. But she can also turn into a cat. Oh. So sometimes if she's not in her little kid form, she'll be this white poofy cat, like from the commercial. Uh, oh, the season. Fancy feast. Yeah. Yeah. Fancy yeah, yeah. feast, yeah. Yeah, so you'll see that cat running around. And she's usually pretty good at helping me out, like, I remember one time uh, back when I was in Maryland, I was backing out my driveway and I look in my rear view mirror and I just see her standing there. So I slam the brakes. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to hit a kid. And I'm glad I did because there was apparently a living cat behind my car that was crossing. So I was like, good, make sure I don't run over a cat. Thank you for that. And she's uh, usually always around. And then there's also an older lady because my relationship with my mother is not exactly the best relationship that anyone would want to have. Um, could be worse, but still not pleasant. And so lack of a mother figure, I do also have an older lady that looks like the old lady from Aristocrats. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she's got like, you know, gray hair and she's also kind of in that nice dress and everything. And like, if I have a nightmare and I wake up, cause sometimes I do have not some, not so nice spirits follow me around and they'll give me nightmares and stuff. I'll wake up with bruises and scratches. And when I wake up from those, I'm freaking out nightmare crying very uneasy and I'll just feel her kind of like brushing my hair and be like it's okay it's okay calm down get you back to sleep and so that also like is a great support system because I've got this little girl that kind of watches out for everything also I like animals so the fact that she's a cat is a bonus yeah and then I've got a new mother figure that sticks around and then I've got just, I think my uncle mm -hmm. has recently joined me as well uh he died last year and I I'm not sure if he's here for a main support group for me. Sure. Uh, but also, I happen to have his car, which is a limited edition Pebble Beach Lexus. There were oh, only 2,000 boy. made. So he may also just be watching out to make sure that I don't mess up his car. Uh, so I'm not 100% sure where his, he's standing on that. But he also, I've noticed he can pop by quite a bit as well. Yeah. See, it, that is an interesting point about spirit guides that people don't talk about enough, is that... Um, a lot of times people say like, oh, you know, if spirit guides, you can only like communicate with them through like divination practices and things like that. And they're only there really to give you guidance with your tarot cards or whatever you're doing. But it's true. A lot of times they are just with you. And sometimes they physically manifest. Personally, uh, my grandmother, who's my like main spirit guide, I've got quite a few, but she's my main one. She shows up as a fiery red cardinal. She was a fiery woman <laughs> in life in general. But if something that I need to like, if I'm not picking up on or, you know, I'm not paying attention to, she'll literally show up as a cardinal on, at a window and go and just peck, 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 peck until I, I get the, uh, the hint. I'm like, oh, she's trying to, she's trying to make something clear to me. Um, she does it to JT now um, because... And she does it to my dad because it was um, his mother. He uh, he gets her sometimes. So 
she it, it's it's a thing you know um sometimes your spirit guides come in ways that you can notice them mm-hmm. and sometimes they show up as physical uh, human forms and sometimes it's animals uh, it's why a lot of times you hear people say you know butterflies I see butterflies and that's how I know like uh, do you not like butterflies? Oh, I have a serious fear of butterflies. Oh, right. Really? And then found, when I found out that monarchs are apparently uh, omnivores and can eat human flesh, nope, no, I got do a problem. They here. Really? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's not okay. <gasps> there are problems, and also the SpongeBob episode didn't help either. Oh yeah. <laughs> so no, I don't do all the butterflies. I didn't know monarchs were omnivores. That's fascinating. I have a big butterfly bush <laughs> in my backyard, so um, don't come over. I guess no, I'm good. I'm good. I'll pass. <laughs> to the backyard. That's a good pass. Uh, good. But. Yeah, we, we have big monarchs that show up in our backyard. So now every time I'm going to look at it and be like, you've been eating human flesh recently? Um, that's fascinating. Wow. Um, yeah, but it, it, is the, it is an interesting thing with spirit guides, though, um, that they show up in whatever way you are going to feel that connection to and what helps you because that is their point their purpose is to help guide you help um be your support system through a spiritual sense so whatever is going to make you feel supported is how they're going to go about so uh super fascinating now in the sense of like savannah spirits uh do you have a favorite haunted location I guess I'm going to have to keep sticking with Kehoe. Again, that sure, is like my absolutely. extended family. Uh, and one of my favorite parts about my job was that I got to educate the living about, you know, debunking and trying to explain to everyone that, no, their kids didn't die. And I worked there, again, for three years. But I was also there during quarantine. So for the, what, eight months I think we were closed – from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., five nights a week, I was there, completely empty haunted bed and breakfast. So that was another great way for me to get to kind of know everyone and know what their habits were because we were just cramped in a house together. So, yeah. of course, what else are we going to do? Might as well talk and get to learn about each other. Um, and while I was there, I decided to do, like, a deep dive history research. I've gotten, like, multiple newspaper articles about Mr. Kehoe, his family being here, the building of the foundry that he had, everything. Uh, I even have actually the registration from when his family came from Wexford, Ireland to Savannah. I've got that documentation as well. Learning about Miss Kehoe, and conveniently, her family was also initially originally from Wexford, Ireland as well. So oh. it was kind of an odd close-knit that they just happened to run into each other when they came to Savannah. And... Yeah, I do have a deep fondness of that family. I remember there was one time that some guests brought in a spirit box. I was nosy. They were out at dinner reservations. I decided, oh, a spirit box. I know what that is. Let me see what I can do. So I did turn it on briefly. and was like, hey, is there anyone here with me? And I just got instantly in a gentleman's voice, which would be Mr. Kehoe, heard you, Aubrey. I'm like, oh, thanks, guys. Now I know. So I've got that also confirmation that, You know, I could easily be in my own head of, you know, I know that they're here, so they know that I'm here and that we're all going to get along perfectly fine. But having that, like, verbal confirmation as well is kind of going to give me that big good. It's not residual. It's definitely some uh, intelligent spirit that's in here at the time, and it is them. Wow. Yeah, that's... um that's such a cool experience to have because I feel like a lot of people don't get to actually like really get to know the spirits in mm-hmm. Savannah because it's hard to be able to spend that much time in a place where you would be able to get to know them in that deeply. Um, but uh, I wish you had like the recording um, of Mr. Kehoe talking because I always love hearing when things catch on a spirit box. but And especially to include my name nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, That's especially really, really impressive as well. And even when I wasn't there, like if I had the night off or anything, and I apparently I still have had some guests that were had come back, even though I'm not working there, uh, ask about me because we'd occasionally get mediums. And they're like, oh, you know, yeah, you guys have quite a few spirits here. Oh, and oh, there's one other girl. Yeah, the one that they really like. There's a girl here that brings toys for everyone to play with. She works the night shift. Oh, and they mentioned me. It's like, yeah, that's her. But this is a person I've never met before. So the fact that the spirits are conveying to these mediums, yes, talk to them about Aubrey. You've got to meet her. She's apparently this great girl. that, And I do bring toys in for the kids. I, it's Again, not a big fan of living. 
love the dead. So I'll bring toys for them, whatever makes them happy. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to honor them too, you know? Um, And that's why we like, we leave things on headstones and why we leave offerings for ancestors and things of that nature, because it's, um, it's, there's like we've said before, they're still souls. They still, you know, um, can feel that kindness that you're getting from that sort of thing. So definitely. Now, um, personally, I would say like one of the creepiest places in Savannah is uh, Wright Square. Have you ever had an experience in Wright Square? Uh, honestly, I haven't had that many. I also don't spend a lot of time there. I'm usually just rushing past for one thing or another. Uh, Wright Square Antiques, though, I've had a few experiences there. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, the CVS, most haunted CVS in the United States. Of course, I've had experiences there as well. And then also Old Factory. Those are my three most visited yeah. locations on Wright Square. Since I do spend more time there, that's mainly where I start to notice anyone or anything that's in the area. Yeah. CVS is so fun to talk about because people don't believe you uh, when you say like this CVS is haunted and they're like no it's not it's a CVS and it's like but it is though oh yeah I mean when they first opened they were going to be a 24-hour CVS which is desperately needed in downtown Mm -hmm. yes Um, so you know and freestanding CVS's that aren't 24 hours are kind of rare you you just don't see freestanding CVS's that that weren't 24 hours especially at the time that, that this one opened and it was 24 hours for about a month. <laughs> and then they went to midnight, and then they went to 10, and then they went to 8. And it, it was because the workers were like, this is not good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we do not mm-hmm. want to be here. And they, they basically tested it. They're like, we'll go till midnight. And they're like, not good. And we'll go to 10. Not good. And so at 8, they close at 8, which should tell you a lot because it is a busy city. It's a, it's a college town. It's in need of a drugstore that is open late. The bars are open until 3 a.m. Right, so exactly. The, anyone that's in town is usually going to be out until 3 or 4. Exactly. And so the fact that it closes at 8 might be a best, the best indication you can have because they're, they're turning down money. They're turning mm-hmm. down cash money mm-hmm. for the welfare or for the perceived welfare <laughs> of people who are like, I don't want to be here after dark. Yeah, because um, the problem was is they couldn't keep employees because – Things were flying off of shelves. There were, you know. Yeah, supposedly there was security footage from, uh, but the but corporate was like lock that down. You know <laughs> that is not going out. You're not you're not sharing of this. Course. Yeah, you know it's like just lock it down. And and I I almost think it was a bargaining chip in in the whole process of changing the hours. Yeah, I feel like though that would have been the best marketing tactic ever, and be like, here's footage of the most haunted CVS in America. <laughs> So, um, and people would just go to CVS to be like, is there a ghost in here? <laughs> you know? I think uh, there's a lot of liability though. Sure. Uh, Issue wise. Like, you know. Somebody gets people, hit with a cereal box from a. <laughs> no, people going in and like, you know, drawing blood to, you know, try oh, to. Oh, yeah. You know, Isn't there a haunted things. subway somewhere? Is there? Yeah. I think it was the subway was built on top of what was originally like a haunted building and apparently people would come into the subway and play with a Ouija board. I oh can't remember Lord. which building it yeah, was. I think that there was a, there was a period of time when, because there was a Kmart that was also like that, the, the haunted Kmart somewhere where people <laughs> would like sneak in and like try to have these little, you know, seances and things. <laughs> And it's like, calm down. It's it's still a store. You know? <laughs> That's <laughs> when you start making rules. Retail. All right, you can do it, but you got to buy fifty dollars worth of well, merchandise. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Sales tactic. If you want to contact the dead, you have to buy your products. That's right. that's mm-hmm. about it. We sell Ouija boards in yes. uh, aisle seventeen. The paranormal <laughs> investigation. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. But so anybody out there who has a haunted retail place, just there you go. That's tactics. your market. Yeah. That's your marketing tactic. Is say that you're super haunted and then sell paranormal equipment I'm just <laughs> shocked there isn't a paranormal investigation supply store in town like a right? really well developed because there are some places where you can buy little bits and pieces but yeah you'd be savannah practically you know writes its own paranormal yeah. check at that point mm-hmm. you should have a store that's like buy this kit buy this yeah you know here's a camera we've removed all the ir filters can we go at it exactly well so many people come here and they want to learn how to paranormal investigate mm-hmm. and but people are like well where do i get the equipment i'm like amazon 
Yeah, yeah Amazon. It's literally, um, if you didn't know that already, uh, you you can literally buy things on to Amazon. Create a dropship store to paranormal. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, because I, I show some different paranormal investigation tools um, when I give tours and stuff, and people are like, well, where, where can I buy that? Like, it must be like a very, like, niche kind of store. I'm like, I literally got these on Amazon. Yeah, that's, absolutely. that's about it. Um, it's so readily available nowadays, which is great for, you know, us because like people like us because you know we can say like oh i want to go investigate in this cemetery or whatever and then you can just have your paranormal yep. investigation kit in two days which is super cool um but yeah have you ever been on a paranormal investigation only at the Starlweed house uh however that is potentially going to change because i had a lady take one of my tours and a Apparently, she was a tour guide for the Winchester Mansion, which has been on my bucket list for a while now. Uh, and thanks to my lovely guests that keep taking my tours, I've been developing a roadmap throughout the U.S. of every single spot I need to yes. stop based on where they're from. But I do currently have a trip set up to go to San Francisco coming up in, I believe, February or March. And I've got Winchester marked down and I've got Alcatraz marked down. So nice. I am looking into those and potentially seeing what I can do there uh, just out of curiosity. So I'll see how that goes. Um, now, obviously, there are limits. As much as I love the paranormal, there are limits to how much I'm willing to do. There are some places I don't feel comfortable going. And if I am to go, limits of how comfortable I feel staying. So mm-hmm. that's going to be kind of one of those. I know especially Alcatraz has like a, what, a four-hour, five-hour tour. Mm-hmm. And that may just be a tad bit too much for me. And if that happens for a lot of sensitive and mediums. Sometimes it can just be way too overwhelming if, because spirits can usually tell, and they're like, oh my God, this person can see me, they can talk to me, and so I don't want to be bombarded with, say, you know, 20 people at a time, because I'm just going to mentally get drained, I'm going to shut down, may or may not need to call the paramedics to get a blood transfusion, I don't know, so just be on the safe side, I may have to limit it to just a basic two-hour, but... I'll see how it goes, and I'll report back when that time comes around. Absolutely. Um, You should definitely check out Lake Shawnee Abandoned Amusement Park if you ever make it up towards West Virginia, because the kid ghosts would love you. It's all kid ghosts. It literally is. It's um, we just went there recently, and they it it was the same way where they were like, "She can see me. She can (laughs) see me." And I was like, "Oh, hello, everybody," Mm -hmm. which is fun. Um, But they do overnight ones, which I would like to do. To a certain degree, but honestly, the ghosts were even active during the day, so mm-hmm. it wasn't even necessary. And they they do a great job because they literally you take the tour, and then they're like, "You just gotta be off the property by six and that was it. So they they literally just let us kind of go around and do what we wanted, which was super cool. Um, but yeah, that that definitely should be on your bucket list. But I am very jealous that you're going to the Winchester Mansion. I'm That's excited. I like the movie. I know the stories. I And even just for an architect standpoint, yeah. I feel like I have to go. Absolutely. I mean, they, um, during COVID, the Winchester Mansion did this thing where they had live streams mm-hmm. um, that you could watch of the Winchester Mansion. So, of course, I did that during my quarantine. Um, but... Yeah, such a we we're living in such a technological age. It's it's shocking that people aren't um, outfitting a lot of these very famous haunted places with infrared cameras that you can access mm-hmm. on twenty four hour streams, because it, it's it's about most ghost investigations only last an hour to four. You know, it's 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 a very concentrated period of time, and then a lot of times ghost hunters walk away being like, "Well, there's nothing there," because they didn't feel it. And it's like, "Well, you were there for a fraction exactly of, of, of its of its existence, and you were also there, you know, pointedly there to exploit or to find or you know, mm-hmm. a, a lot of the." energy you bring into a ghost investigation is the very energy that spirits might try to stay away from Mm -hmm. you know um so it is an interesting thing that if you get the opportunity to be in a place regularly repeatedly uh you are developing a sense of space and energy and everything around you is kind of conforming to the fact that you're there Mm -hmm. and that you are you're always going to be present there and they get very attached and and the attachments are not just spiritual, it's it's environmental. You know, you can really change the environment you're in by being open and being uh, uh, receptive. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I wonder um, in the sense of the Kehoe house, because you spent so much time there, I wonder if you've left a residual haunting there of sorts. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Because (laughs) um, we talk about how like, you know, even the living can haunt places of sorts. Um, So I I feel like because you had such a bond with that house, I wouldn't be surprised people are like, oh, there's this uh, new ghost that I've started seeing around the house. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And what's really interesting about it is, again, I was just going there for a job interview and a few like days prior, so I was exploring Savannah, getting to learn about the area. And there was one house that I was like, oh my God, this house is gorgeous. If I ever win the lottery, I'm going to live here. I like, I'm in love with this house. And then I ended up working at Kehoe, realized that the house that I was in love with was right across the square. Found out that was the original Kehoe house. That was the house that Mr. and Ms. Kehoe initially lived in. And I was like, so my connection with the Kehoe has actually started long before I had worked there, like a week before I even got the wow. job or knew about them. So I thought yeah. it was kind of interesting how that just placed Absolutely. Into, in, in a way. Absolutely. I feel like everybody in Savannah has that one house that they're like, the, if I won the lottery, that would be the one it's that so I'm, I, I, we, JT and I have a house like that. It's uh, over on Warren Square, I believe. It's off of East Bryan Street. It's this big yellow house. It's mm. got like a really pretty wraparound porch. Don't know what the hauntings are inside it. It's a private residence. But one day, if uh, you know we're rich enough, we will knock on their door and be like, how much you want for this house? Because I love it. It is so beautiful. Um, but that is crazy, though, that, that it was the original Kehoe house. Maybe you you have a soul connection with the Kehoe. I Kehos. was wondering that because it all just conveniently worked out so well, and we all just got along with each other so well. And it's just like, this is going too smoothly. Something's going on. How is this mm-hmm. going on? And the more time I spend in Savannah, I have started to notice that I, the chances of me having a previous life here are, like, I'd probably put it at a solid 97% chance that sure. it happened. And I actually, starting a few months ago, since I've been initially when I started working at Kehoe, I would limit my expansion of exploring Savannah to the downtown, anything that was north of Oglethorpe. Then I started working at the Sorrells. So then it was anything that was north of Liberty. And now I'm just casually expanding outwards. And I started getting flashes in my head on occasions when I'm down here of a house that's I've never seen before. I don't know where it is, but I know that for some reason it's somewhere in the southeastern section mm. in Midtown. I don't, I've never seen it. I don't know where it is. So now I'm wondering, well, was that my original house when I lived here initially? Uh, I don't know. So it's one of those things where the more I spend in Savannah, the more I'm curious about, is there more to these hauntings than I'm realizing that maybe I actually am currently already haunting a house and then I've got my soul that somehow ended up here and so now I'm re-here again and... It, it happens. It, it yeah. really does. A lot of people have reported that they, you know, um, see like a house uh, in their dreams, like their entire life. And then they end up going to that house and they're like, wait, this is a house mm-hmm. that I, I know for a fact I lived here at some point, um, you know. And so it's very possible your soul just kind of found its way back over to Savannah. It took sure. me a solid nine hour drive, but I'm working yeah, on it. <laughs> working on it. Yeah. Um, well, this has been great though. Um, I really have enjoyed, you know, talking about all these theories and stuff like that. We don't always go into, you know, past life regression and stuff like that. So it's fun to talk about for sure. And I've learned so much about the Kehoe ghost from you. Cause like, I'm glad that we're finally able to actually talk about, um, you know, what the actual spirits are there because there's just, like I've said, so much misinformation with those spirits. And so it's good to hear Mm -hmm. that they're just a bunch of sweet ghosts. So go stay at the Kehoe house for sure. It's a beautiful house in general. Absolutely. Um, So if you're looking for a romantic getaway or something, that is definitely the place to go. Um, But uh, Chris, do you have a ghost tip for us before we end things? Yes. um, Don't ghost hunt alone. Always bring a, a group, but don't bring too many people because that also is counterproductive. But when you're using any equipment, cameras or anything like that, be sure to let each person use a, a piece of equipment because the person holding the equipment is oftentimes the determinant as to whether or not any evidence will be caught. Uh, one person could be using a camera, hand it to another person, the ne- next person uses the camera and catches something. And the reason for that is spirits do still, even with equipment, 
gravitate towards the sensitive and towards those people who are open enough to experience it. That's a good ghost tip. So, well, awesome. Well, we are, um, as always, on TikTok. If you want to follow us over there at the Savannah Underground, if you want to become a part of the Para Junkie fam, in um, <laughs> yes, if uh, you haven't heard, that is our new fan base um, name. Thanks to Patreon, our patrons have decided that that's what it's going to be. Um, so if you want to get further into that and join our Patreon, you can find us at patreon.com slash Savannah Underground. And we will see you in the next one. So my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all. <laughs>